So I've realized that I'm very much showing my aquatic bias in a lot of the activities that we're, that we're talking about. But part of that is because the aquatic environment really encompasses all of the human impacts that the world experiences. Everything flows to rivers. You see that on drainage ditches, flows to the sea, be careful what you're dumping on the ground, because basically anything that you put anywhere eventually is going to run downhill and is going to end up in water and probably end up in the ocean. And so thinking about what does that mean for the ecology of a stream and how does that change um, the readings that you guys did for today looking at aquatic invertebrates, talk a little bit about, okay, well, how does removing basically the invertebrate community influence what's going on in terms of organic matter processing in the stream? Um, and you could think of that, how does that uh, translate to other species that are also in the stream? So when you think about fish production, <coughs> birds, if you remove the algal food base or you know, change the algal food base or change the invertebrate community, how does that translate to other things that people also are interested in? Um, and also think about how does that translate to changes in water quality? So these are... This is one of the coolest places you've ever had the opportunity to go. Um, this is Ash Meadows, which is part of Death Valley National Park, um, but it's not in Death Valley proper. It's in Nevada, uh, basically on the high plain on the east side of the park. And there's a bunch of these springs that come out of the ground, uh, and they're just crystal clear, and they have these really cool endemic fish um, the desert pupfish, and so that's the, all these little blue guys, and it's the re it's pre pretty much one of the reasons we have the Endangered Species Act. So there's a single, uh, basically, cavern system called Devil's Hole in Ash Meadows, and it's basically like just a cavern that's like down in a rock, and you can walk up to it, and you see just it's really a hole in the ground, and it goes down. Oh yeah, it's got crazy fences around yeah. it. Um, some guys peed. Yeah, some guys tried to break in, tried to steal all the puppies. Joe guys peed and almost like wiped the species out. And now you're recorded on lecture time. People came. I was taught that in a lecture at this school. Nice. So, Devil's Hole was being uh, basically water levels at Devil's Hole were being impacted by human water extraction. So people were like, hey, this is a, there's obviously water here. Let's use it to basically improve development, improve agriculture in this area. So they started aquaculture production for like tropical fish in some of these, some of these streams and also started extracting the groundwater. The cool thing or the crazy thing about Devil's Hole is it's basically like, like this, and the water level is typically somewhere around here. This is the only place that the pupfish can spawn, and it's basically like this deep. If this water level drops below that shelf, then pupfish can't spawn anymore. And so maintaining that water level is particularly crucial, and these fish have been isolated for thousands of years. So anyway, this was one of the uh, one of the, this fish was one of the emphasis for the Endangered Species Act, protecting the species. Because um, there's enough differentiation between this tiny little cavern and a couple hundred yards down the valley in these, in these different spring systems um, that you could actually pretty easily call them different species. Yeah. So that's the only place that has that fish? The devil's old puppfish is only kind of devil. Have they ever tried to go to like, repopulate that fish somewhere else? They have tried very hard. Um, so they actually have a devil's old puppfish rearing facility there that actually tries to mimic this, literally tries to mimic this structure. So they have a little shelf and they have water coming from that same system. And they've had a fairly hard time keeping keeping the fish in that system. So, um, and when people go and mess with that system, 
or there was actually a big, there was an earthquake up in that area and it caused a big wave and a bunch of, uh, I think a bunch of fish got either injured or washed out um, during that and the population numbers went down. What's, so, what's like the most important factor that has some What? Just like isolation, the pupfish are pretty have, have um, pretty varied tolerances. So in Death Valley proper, there's a salt creek, a creek called Salt Creek, and it's very very saline. And there are pupfish that live in Salt Creek, but they're different than the fish that are living in these, which are which are freshwater creeks. So anyway, pupfish are cool. It's I think the bottom. So, first I wanted to talk about primary production and benthic algae. And you can really categorize algae based on their growth forms. And so this, this figure shows you the different growth forms of algae from crustose and prostate. Um, prostrate, not prostate. Um, algae to stocked algae into longer filamentous algae and then gelatinous algae. Um, and you can see that they've also uh, delineated where different species or different feeding gills of invertebrates and fish are going to be feeding. So you've got scrapers and gatherers up here, and I'll talk more about those in a little bit. Um, raspers and scrapers down here, um, and I don't remember who's feeding in the, on the larger filaments. But you also have how are they attached to the rocks? And I'm mostly putting these terms because you might read a paper and be like, what the heck is epilithon? And epilithon, basically, it's just saying, this is growing on a rock. So this is algae that's growing on a rock. This is algae that's growing on sediment. This is algae that's growing on other plants. And there's a couple of other terms for algae that's growing on wood. And it's basically just to give you a sense of where was somebody collecting this algae? Does it have a specificity to some particular type of habitat? And then you can also categorize algae based on what type of algae. And these are some of the most common types. Um, diatoms have uh, calcium carbonate um, shell on them. And you're often seeing them sort of attached to rocks or in sort of a matrix on top of the on top of rock. You've got your green algae and your cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are typically not as tasty for, um, for consumers. And cyanobacteria are also um, species that you often will see causing um, toxic uh, problems for other species. So they'll have um, cyanotoxins that can be problematic for both humans, for drinking water, and for other species. Um, and you probably saw um, some chrysophytes, the golden algae. They were that sort of, kind of jellyish map on top of the, on top, I think, of the cayenne. Okay. And when we think of how algae are controlled in a stream, you can think of it on sort of two factors your biomass accrual. And that's going to be coming from what resources are available. And so more nutrients, more light, warmer temperatures typically are going to lead to higher biomass. And when we're thinking about higher biomass, it often ends up being these erect stock or filamentous taxa. Because basically, you're getting a lot of biomass, so they're growing off of a surface. And so that allows you to have much more uh, algae per unit area. But then biomass is also getting lost. And first, let's talk about grazing. So we'll talk in detail about the different kinds of invertebrate grazers. But then there's also vertebrates, like fish and birds, that are feeding on, on algae. And so the more grazing you have, you're typically going to be driving this to lower biomass. And you're going to end up with a community that remains that's more of these low-growing, tightly adhering algae. Another factor that's pretty important is disturbance. And so you're thinking about algae, they're mostly non-modile, and so they're kind of attached to something. 
So how instable the substrate is that they're attached to is really going to determine how much of a population you can get, how much growth you can get. If you're in a, in a stream and the rocks are tumbling around all the time, well, probably half the time they're not exposed to the sun, and so they're not able to grow. And so, but if a rock were fixed in place all the time, very good predictability that there's always going to be sunlight hitting it, so it's always going to have that resource. Velocity does something a little bit more interesting. At high velocities, one, you're probably going to get some instability, but also it's just going to be more difficult for things to attach to, to the rock substrate. And you're not going to get so much of these larger filamentous things because they're going to start breaking off. You also have um, basically the algae at the bottom getting old, senescing, and dying. And so you got algae, algae's growing, and if the newest stuff is at the end, and the oldest stuff is at the base, that stuff dies and then whoop, breaks off. And the higher the flow, the more likely it is to break off. So you often see in a stream that has a lot of filamentous algae, you often see a lot of filamentous algae floating down in the current. Um, and that's because of that uh, senescence. If you have lots of suspended solids that are sort of settling out on top of the rock, then you're not going to get very much light going in. So you're not going to have as much uh, production of algae being, uh, being happening. But I talked a little bit about nutrients. And nutrient availability is going to be, so remember we're in a stream. So things are flowing in one direction. Nutrients are basically always getting um, transported past the algae, so they can potentially take nutrients out of the water column and use them. At sort of a medium velocity, you're probably going to have less solids settling out on you. You're going to have more nutrients available, and so you're going to have potentially more growth. So sort of these intermediate velocities, you're ending up getting more algal growth, then you are at the really low because nutrients maybe become more limited if you're not having much transport of nutrients past them. Um, and at really high, nutrients don't matter so much. Now it's it's the other factors that matter. Okay. So now let's move into something a little bit bigger, the macrophytes. And this includes flowering plants, mosses, liverworts. Because of the nature of macrophytes, they're typically going to be found in sort of these backwater and slow water zones. Uh, one of the interesting things from a habitat standpoint is they're often also making the habitat more complex. So you're basically taking and making vertical structure. So hiding places for fish or invertebrates, but you also have the potential that they are trapping and slowing velocities. And did I actually put that figure in here? I did put a figure in here. Anyway, like this is a, the river is, is flowing through this uh, massive thing of watercress, and there's basically just a tiny little bit of open channel over here. However, this stuff is pretty delicate. As soon as there's a high flow vent, more or less this entire thing was denuded. There was, there was no water press there anymore. Um, but at sort of medium velocities, the structures of the, of the vegetation itself can slow down that velocity. And remember when we were talking about the sediment transport, slower velocities can only carry finer particles. And so you're going to have a lot of those particles settling out. And so this is kind of one of the features of a wetland, is slowing down, retaining water, retaining sediment, potentially retaining nutrients. Less common in streams, at least as a major component of the algal community, are the phytoplankton. That's not to say they're not present, but in smaller streams, as we talked about with the river continuum concept, in smaller streams, they're not going to be making up a major component of the food resources available. As we get to bigger and bigger streams, where there's sort of less surface area 
and more water area, phytoplankton become more common. In the early days, people thought that phytoplankton might not be able to sustain themselves in, in large river systems, but it seems that because there's sort of enough water retention time or time between points in a river and algal, algal production can be really high, you can have a doubling of the cell count like one to two times per day. So depending on how long it takes water to get from point A to point B, you can have your algal community um, be self-sustaining. Light penetration is going to dictate the abundance of your phytoplankton. Um, suspended particles, which you often also will get in large river systems, those suspended fines are gonna block the sunlight from going through the water, and so you probably will only have algal production really up closer to the surface. But the, the algae themselves, and you'll find this also in the lake, can self-shade. So you get enough algae at the top of the water column that they're blocking most of the light, and so the algae below them don't have any light to use. So, some of your reading from Brower was talking about taking biomass and then measuring production. And so I wanted to talk about a couple of different ways that people measure production in, in river systems and aquatic systems. And so one of, the, one of the ways people do that, if you're thinking about stuff in the water column, so maybe you're thinking of phytoplankton, you can basically take a water sample that contains those phytoplankton, put half of it in a dark bottle and half of it in a light bottle. And what you're seeing over here is the light bottle is going to have um, production and the dark bottle is going to have respiration. So you're having sun present in the, in the light bottle, so you're getting oxygen production. And in the dark bottle, you're only having consumption because algae are still consuming oxygen regardless of whether they're, um, whether they're uh, photo, photosynthesizing or not. And so the difference between the gross productivity um, and the production is our respiration and our net productivity. And this is looking at over the water column, they're seeing at the very surface less production, a little bit deeper, more production. And as you get deeper and deeper beyond the, the photic zone where there's a light available, production is going to You can also do this with particles. So say you're interested in what's the primary production on a rock in the stream and you wanted to try and scale that up. You basically put a rock in a chamber, a dark and a light chamber, and measure production of oxygen. I'll talk in the water quality lecture about whole system metabolism and how you can measure what's going on without collecting particular particles. Some of the challenges of these is are, are, are the bottles themselves influencing the measurements you're making? Um, and can you really scale up what goes on in a little pan to save the entire stream? But there's things you can do with these in terms of like nutrient uptake that are a little bit more challenging to do on a larger scale. And I point this out from an environmental science standpoint is things that we do to river systems. So maybe we're changing light availability. Maybe we're changing nutrient availability. Maybe we're changing the grazers that are present via something that we're doing, pollution or whatever could then translate into changes in the primary production of that system. And you can have things like changes in the community, and maybe you get a lot of cyanobacteria showing up, which is one of the, the big problems with nutrient pollution. Okay. Our other big food resource in a stream is detritus and decomposition. And this is <coughs> composed of basically anything non-living that has organic carbon. Mostly when we're thinking of this, we're thinking of fallen leaves and woody debris. Um, but dead animals like invertebrates all the way to fish and, and larger are also organic carbon that are potentially available within the stream. And then there's things of unknown origin but still contain organic compounds. 
And I'm going to talk about three different types of organic matter in the system. I think you read a little bit about this. The, really, the only distinction between them is how big they are. And when we're talking about coarse particulate organic matter, or CPOM, um, it's stuff that's greater than one millimeter in size. And we're thinking of things like leaves, macrophytes that are dying back seasonally, so stuff like watercress or um, cattails die back during the wintertime. Woody debris, like a tree falling into a stream, is organic carbon, potentially, of course, particulate organic matter. It's often very slowly utilized. Wood has a lot of components to it that make it very difficult to break down, but some things can break down. And then plant and animal parts that are fairly big. Thinking back to this wood component, what the structure of the leaf and the chemical composition of that material determines how quickly it breaks down. Um, and so different species of, say, tree will break down at much different rates. And so that's, again, something that people cause big changes and say the vegetation present at a river system, and you may go from something that break down, breaks down very quickly to something that breaks down very, <laughs> very slowly. Um, typically, these breakdown rates are related to uh, temperature, and warmer temperatures, leaves break down more quickly. Uh, and the breakdown is often driven by invertebrates and microbes, but also think that physical processes, basically just turbulence, you've probably like, just grabbed a leaf and messed with it with your hands, you could break it down into finer, finer particles. When we think of leaf processing in a stream, you've got the leaves coming in, they're wetting, and then you start getting leaching immediately. So if you just took some leaves from anywhere and put them in a thing of water, probably the next day you'd come back and it'd look like tea. So that's your dissolved organic matter leaching out of your leaves. You then will have microbial colonization going on. So the microbes, the bacteria, fungi start breaking down the leaves. Then you start having invertebrates often colonizing those leaves and breaking it down. And then, it's, then, then these things start breaking down completely and end up as species um, and fragments of leaves in the system. Uh, and you can see how much weight loss occurs for each of these different components. So you can have a pretty substantial amount of weight loss occurring just in the leaching of material out of the leaf. And think about this. We'll talk a little bit about this all in a little bit. Um, one of the questions that invertebrate people have had for a long time is, are the invertebrates actually feeding on the leaf? Or are they feeding on the microbes on the leaf? And so it's basically, are they eating the cracker or are they eating the peanut butter on the cracker? And it seems like it's a little column A, a little column B. So the next category is fine particulate organic matter. And this is stuff from, say, half a micron to one millimeter. Uh, it may, you could also say this is like 0.45 um, micrometers. One of the primary sources of fine particulates is going to be the breakdown of the coarse particulates, sort of intuitively. But you also have small consumers. That are, that are feeding on organic matter, and they're pooping it out. And so their, their feces becomes fine particulate organics. And there are some species that do seem to focus on feeding on feces of other species. You can also have microbes, so microbes attached to rocks, or microbes in the water column that are taking that dissolved organic matter so some of like the leachate maybe from a leaf, and taking it and incorporating into their tissue. Algae, we talked a little bit about senescence. Even if you're not a big filamentous algae, you can still get scoured off of rock, and so the dead cells can be sloughing off of, off of rocks. And then you can also have things that are being contributed from the soil or the forest floor. 
and getting washed into the stream. The dissolved organic matter pool is often the greatest source of organic carbon in a stream, but one of the interesting things about it is it's often not that available to biota. It's present, but it's in the calcium forms that are more difficult for things to grow. The sources of this dissolved organic matter, we talked a little bit about leachate and POM, so that's just taking off the, the size designation, particular organic matter. You can have algae and plants just excreting or extracellularly releasing um, dissolved organic matter. And soils and groundwater can have dissolved organic matter present in it and can be contributing it to the water column. This is important for what's going on on, say, a rock surface. So you've got a biofilm on top of that surface that's made up of a combination of different types of <coughs> So you've got, in this matrix, you've got <coughs> algae and bacteria, potentially fungi, enzymes that aren't associated with an animal or a plant anymore. <coughs> and our dissolved organic matter can be taken up by this biofilm. And things are feeding often on that biofilm. So, We've talked in detail now about coarse particulates, dissolved organic matter, and fine particulates. Now let's think about who's eating them. And for a lot of this coarse particulates, we've got our shredder taxa. And I'll talk a little bit more about these, but the ephemeroptera, trichoptera, and plecoptera are some of the, the big species that are doing a lot of this, this shredding. There are, some, there are some other species that are doing part, and groups that are doing it as well. Um, when we have the fine particulates, you've got some that are sort of like going around and gathering up little particles. You've also got some that are filtering it. So some of the invertebrates that you'll see in the sample that I, I got you build these cool little nets in flowing sections of the stream. And so they actually are kind of like a spider in that they use that little net to collect particles and then they feed the off the particles that are collected in the nets. Um, Catacyzer is crazy. Um, Those things are like a millimeter or two big? What bigger than that? I just like a catacyzer. Oh, okay. it's pretty big. Um, and then dissolved organic matter is going to go into the microproducers, the algae and stuff on the rock, and see so you've got scrapers that are, um, that are removing that biofilm off of the rocks. You've also got some that are piercing individual algal cells and sucking the material out of them. And again, all the species is ending up in this fine particulate organic matter pool. Okay. So that's sort of the, the very quick and dirty background on some of the food resources. I'm not going to talk about uh, secondary production of like fishes and those things, um, though I, I find those particularly interesting. But we'll, for the purposes of today, we're going to talk about three um, major groups of invertebrates that people have thought are good indicators of stream health. And it's mostly because these species are fairly intolerant of not so great conditions. But the challenge is what we consider to be not so great conditions, maybe natural conditions in some streams, in some stream ecosystems. So most of these species you're going to find very abundant in a healthy sort of rock bottom to cobble gravel bottom stream. When you start talking about a river that's naturally sandy or has lots and lots of fines, and that there are streams that have that as, an, as the natural substrate, the EPT may start breaking down. It may not be as relevant. And then other species may be just naturally more present in those, even without any disturbance. But it's very commonly used, and I think one of the papers you guys read talk about it as being just something that's universally sort of thought about 
and you're first thinking, oh, how could we, what could we use as a bioindicator for stream health? EPT are the big taxes that people are interested in. So the ephemeroptera are the mayflies. And before you guys go and start looking at these under the microscope, I wanted to give you the, the quick, how do you figure out first where, where should I even start guessing? And generally, and I say generally, mayflies all have three tails. Um, you can see they have a bunch of different body shapes but they generally all have three tails. There's gonna be another species, or an, I'm sorry, another order that has um, three tails, but notice almost all of these three tails are fairly fine. They're not, they don't look like a flag. They don't have a lot of material on them. Um, the, other, the other group that, that has three tails, but those are typically kind of like flag shaped, um, are the damselfly larvae. And that's because actually those their tail is a gills. Um, on these guys, their gills are usually underneath their, their armpits or along the sides of their of their body. Um, so mayflies, you can generally use the three tails as your first sorting mechanism, and then look at that tail and start figuring out. But not all mayflies have have three tails. Some of the mayflies don't have two tails. <coughs> And the other thing I wanted to talk about is aquatic invertebrates are typically the larval stage. The adults are also present in these systems, and adults are, are a major contributor to um, like what, trout eating, for example. The emergence of these adults often all happens at once, and then you often call it a hatch. Um, so you, if you're driving by, say, a river in the Sierras this summer, you see just clouds and clouds of a bug's flying around in the sky, it's probably going to be mayfly, stonefly, or caddisfly, um, because they're the big producers in a lot of these streams, and they often will all come and emerge at a similar time. Okay, our next group, Pachoptera, stoneflies. These guys typically like sort of higher velocity areas um, with a lot of oxygen. These guys almost always have two tails. Their tails are usually more robust than mayflies. Generally, stoneflies are more robust than mayflies, but not always. Um, this is what a stonefly adult looks like. And then, saving the best for last, the trichoptera. The caddisflies, they look kind of like your, uh, your garden variety uh, like food moth when they when they emerge as adults, but as larvae in the water, many of the caddisflies build cases, and they all build cases out of these different materials, and like the variety of different types of cases that caddisflies can make is like I didn't even capture it. All of these are elongate ones. Some will make like spiral cases, like a snail. Um, but they're basically just taking particles out of the environment and gluing them together and making a house. Um, and then they'll live in this, and so they have three little legs at the front and then a little gripping tail, and they'll hide inside these. And so this is a great way for them to avoid predation, because most things won't, don't want to eat the case itself. They can crawl around the bottom, so if you go to the stairs, you'll often see like little sticks that look like they're crawling around the bottom of the creek. Those are usually caddis flies. Um, and so some of them are making cases out of rocks, some of them are making out of like uh, organic matter or twigs or leaves. Um, and so you just see this massive variety of things. But there's also, yeah. They live in these like kind of like hermit crabs, like, or do they like cocoon in them? They, when they are pupating, they will seal off, they'll attach it to a rock, and they'll seal off the end, and then they'll emerge. But before they pupate, they'll just sort of like walk around a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, basically. But there's also caddisflies that don't live in cases, and I, th I don't think we have any in the sample that have cases. But there are the free-living caddisflies, 
Uh, and these guys mostly make nets on on the on the side of the rock, and they're using that to collect partic particulates. As they get. All right. So that's all I was going to talk about today. So you guys all have samples from Camp Park. Uh, 